Carpal tunnel release surgery is undertaken to relieve compression of the median nerve at the wrist, the carpus in Latin, where it travels through a connective tissue tunnel. It is quick and relatively minor surgery on the hand and can be accomplished with sedation rather than general anesthesia using one of several regional anesthesia techniques. I'm going to describe my preferred method, which is to perform distal upper limb blocks of the forearm. Brachial plexus blocks are also effective, but may be overkill for this surgery, especially if you take into account their adverse effects. Intravenous regional anesthesia is another commonly used option, but it's a relatively time-consuming and complex setup that requires familiarity by the entire operating room team for safety and efficacy. Local anesthesia infiltration at the site is also possible, but in my experience, the more meticulous surgeons prefer to avoid this as it can make their dissection planes less clear. There are three nerves that I would block for this surgery. The first two are fairly obvious, the median nerve and the ulnar nerve. However, I also block the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve because in most patients, there are branches that innervate the base of the palm at the wrist. This was illustrated nicely by Keplinger and colleagues who found that the area of the hand where the incision for carpal tunnel surgery is made is not consistently innervated by either the median or ulnar nerves. Preparation for the blocks includes a linear ultrasound probe, 20 milliliters of a short-acting local anesthetic, such as 2% lidocaine or mepivacaine, and either a 50 millimeter block needle or a 25 gauge 40 millimeter hypodermic needle. The short beveled block needle is safest in terms of avoiding epineural puncture, but for experienced practitioners, the sharper hypodermic needle pierces skin and fascia more easily and thus can be handled with more finesse. It also lends itself well to an independent single operator technique if mounted directly on the syringe. Start with a mid forearm median nerve block by placing the patient's arm in a supinated position and place the probe in a transverse orientation on the fleshy ventral portion of the mid forearm. At this location, the median nerve is always sandwiched between the flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profundus muscles. The nerve can be anisotropic, so tilt the probe back and forth as needed to make it light up against the muscles. The median nerve may be traced into the distal wrist beyond the innervation of the muscle belly of flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus by the median nerve and its anterior interosseous branch. The main advantage of blocking in a more distal location is to ensure that there is motor sparing of the forearm flexor muscles. An in-plane needle approach is almost always feasible. Approach from medial to lateral or lateral to medial depending on what is most ergonomic. However, be sure to identify and avoid the radial artery if inserting from the lateral aspect of the forearm. In all cases, always advance the needle tip at a tangent to the nerve to prevent mechanical trauma, aiming to pierce and inject into the fascial sheath surrounding the nerve. Here, a short beveled 22 gauge block needle is being used, which provides more tactile feedback, but requires more force to pierce the fascia compared to a sharp 25 gauge needle. 5 to 8 milliliters of local anesthetic within the sheath will block the median nerve effectively. In this example, the median nerve is targeted using a single operator technique with a 25 gauge hypodermic needle. The sharper tip will pierce fascia with less effort and minimal tenting. Mechanical trauma is avoided by always keeping the needle tip tangential to the nerve and performing slow continuous injection during needle advancement creating a fluid jet that pushes the nerve away. Next, perform an ulnar nerve block with the forearm in the same supinated position. The ulnar nerve is easily identified by placing the probe close to the wrist crease over the ulnar artery. The ulnar nerve is always located immediately adjacent and medial to the artery. Both nerve and artery can be traced proximally to the upper forearm where they separate. Target the nerve more proximally to ensure that the distal cutaneous branches are blocked. An in-plane or out-of-plane approach can be used depending on what is ergonomically most feasible. 
In all cases, always advance the needle tip at a tangent to the nerve to prevent mechanical trauma, aiming to pierce and inject into the fascial sheath to surround the nerve. Once again, here a short beveled 22 gauge block needle is being used, hence there is a lot more fascial tenting before it is pierced, compared to a sharp 25 gauge needle. As with the median nerve, 5 to 8 milliliters of local anesthetic within the sheath will block the ulnar nerve effectively. In this example, the ulnar nerve is being targeted more distally where it is lying adjacent to the artery, using a single operator technique with a 25 gauge hypodermic needle. Note how the sharper tip pierces fascia with minimal tenting and thus less effort. Once again, continuous injection during advancement will create a fluid jet that pushes the nerve away and prevents trauma. It's not necessary nor recommended to reposition the needle tip once it is within the fascial envelope surrounding the nerve. Finally, block the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve at the antecubital fossa, just proximal to the elbow crease. The lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve is the terminal branch of the musculocutaneous nerve, and it ascends to the surface in the fascial plane between biceps and brachialis muscles to emerge into a fascial compartment just under the cephalic vein, which is an important landmark. The nerve usually nestles into a triangular-shaped fascial compartment which is lateral to the brachial artery and just under or adjacent to the cephalic vein at the level of the elbow crease and elbow joint. It may be blocked here with a simple injection of local anesthetic into this hyperechoic fascial condensation next to the cephalic vein. Occasionally, the nerve will be large and visible as in this example. However, if it's not clearly seen, just target the fascial condensation adjacent to the vein. I prefer a 25 gauge sharp hypodermic needle for subcutaneous injections as it will penetrate the skin and fascia with less effort and will allow me to better control needle advancement. I prefer to handle the syringe and injection myself, but an intravenous tubing extension and an assistant to perform injection can also be used. As already mentioned, Inject slowly and continuously while advancing into the fascial compartment, which will push the nerve away from the needle tip with the jet of fluid. The nerve often becomes visible as local anesthetic surrounds it. Inject 5 to 6 mils of local anesthetic within the fascial compartment, and this will effectively block the LACN. So there you have it. Three simple and safe block injections for carpal tunnel surgery. Block onset is rapid, occurring within 5 to 10 minutes. Intraoperative propofol sedation will allow the patient to comfortably tolerate the tourniquet for the duration of surgery, which is usually under 30 minutes. Note that there is an medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve that innervates the medial aspect of the forearm, but in my experience it rarely if ever needs to be blocked as it doesn't usually extend to the wrist. If, however, there appears to be incomplete cutaneous sensory blockade over the medial part of the ins planned incision site, or the patient is reacting despite propofol sedation, then infiltrating a little subcutaneous local anesthetic as shown will resolve the problem.